Good morning. Uh, so, Nick Miller from uh, GE in the United States, and I'm a very long time uh, bulk power system uh, person, I guess. And I've been working in the renewable integration for the last 20 years or so. And today is rather, uh, it, it, by the way, it's a pleasure to be here. It's first, my first time in India in many years, so it's great to be back. Um, and it's good uh, sequence from Mr. Fernandez. I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes here about a very a narrow but quite important uh, niche of system modeling um, that is quite important, I believe, uh, in, in the India context. And that is, uh, and he made reference to it, uh, how does one account for large amounts of, of embedded photovoltaics when you're looking at bulk system dynamics? So um, uh, I think everybody in the room is sort of aware of this. This point on the slide, and Mr. Fernandez uh, uh, alluded to it, we are at the point in certainly in North America, in uh, Western Europe, and, and almost certainly the case in India, where the amount of photovoltaics that are connected in what uh, in the distribution systems embedded with loads has the possibility, in fact, has the certainty of affecting the bulk power system dynamics. So uh, there's lots of issues, there's lots of local issues and other sorts of things that are related to the connection of, of photovoltaics. But when we talk about bulk power system stability, and this is uh, of the variety that, that fits with the DigiSilent, um, so we're talking fundamental frequency, positive sequence system stability here. And uh, the, the simple reality is that at the moment, the industry practice is pretty crude. So I'm going to talk about some of the things we're looking at. This is by way of tutorial, and I won't spend much time on this slide, but I wanted it to be in the handout. These are the topics that we're concerned about, and they were also showed up in Mr. Fernandez's slide, of, of bulk power system performance. And this is really, uh, is, is the frequency response adequate? Do you stay away from under frequency load shedding? Do you meet frequency requirements? Okay. And big piece of the interaction between the generation, the variable renewable generation, and the loads dictates your frequency response. Converse, not, uh, and the mate to that on the other side of the coin is transient stability. And in broad brush strokes, transient stability is more locational, more localized. Do pieces of the system stay stuck together? Do they meet swing criteria? Are there risk of separation or risk of local blackouts? Uh, in both cases, the load modeling is a key point, and yet, all right, and, and Mr. Fernandez again set the stage very nicely. We have, as an industry, I work with Paul Sorensen, uh, uh, given a great deal of attention to the fidelity and detailed modeling of generation, all right? So we got great information on one side of the equation, the supply. Tens of thousands of state variables, complicated block diagrams, and all of that stuff pours into uh, a really simple, an Americanism, a Mickey Mouse model of load. All right, so this is an American style distribution system. I took the liberty of sticking a couple of photovoltaic panels on it, and there's load all along here, and there's air conditioners and, and heat pumps and, and PV panels and all this good stuff. And uh, wow, it turns into you know 12 megawatts and six megabars with a really simple-minded model. Well, that is industry standard practice, and I believe it's practice through most of Europe as well. And who are we kidding? All right. And the reason why we do that is because this problem is very hard to solve. So I've been in the modeling business for close to four decades, which is kind of scary, and. When I started my career at GE, we were doing work on load modeling because we knew that you got to get the load model right because otherwise your dynamic simulations uh, really aren't very accurate. So here we are almost four decades later, and I'm saying exactly the same thing and saying, boy, this problem is hard to solve. But we don't have the luxury of turning our heads away from it anymore when possibly 
tens of percent of the total system supply is coming from embedded generation. All right? So our ability for decades to sort of ignore the reality that our load modeling is pathetically simple is coming to an end. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of affairs uh, in trying to ameliorate that. So uh, what we're seeing, and this is a kind of a US-centric discussion here, but I think it's valuable, the use of com so-called composite loads. And in particular, in the western part of the United States, where system transient stability and frequency response are the limiting factors in how the system is run. Um, the, a great deal of attention is given to that. And these uh, composite load models are made of constituents where you add up the bits and pieces. Uh, and uh, that I like to think in drawings. So this is the structure. This is a, a, a one-line diagram of representing the components that are in this composite load model. It's the, that funny acronym is from the the Western Energy uh, Coordinating Council's composite load working model. So instead of having at the 230 bus, right, we use 230 and uh, 345 kV in North America, you got slightly different voltages here, and, and saying, okay, there's the, there's the 230 bus and there's 12 megawatts or 24 megawatts and six megavars connected here, which we all know is a joke. Here is a still spectacularly simplified representation of uh, uh, of a radial dendritic distribution system, and, but it captures a whole bunch of important elements in terms of the reactive consumption of, of the system, uh, the fact that the dynamics of different kinds of loads, so air conditioners behave differently than water pumps, than, than inverter-based stuff, so we can split up the load between these and capture with standard load models, but of different characteristics, some static ones, and then for today's discussion, we are adding in a lumped, but non-trivial representation of the photovoltaics. All right, so this is still, in some sense, hugely simplified, but in another sense, enormously complicated. All right. So built into this thing, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples, be careful of my time. One of the key elements that we find in our system studies is, is uh, how, does the photo, how do the photovoltaics tolerate system disturbances? After all, that's what we're worried about in transient stability runs, right? Faults, frequency swings. So this, and I'm going to walk you through all this. The point is to show that there's logic in this WECC model to represent whether or not the, the generation continues to operate during voltage depressions, during frequency depressions, and whether or not it comes back when the voltage or the frequency recovers. So there's two pieces. Does it drop, does it drop during an event, and does it come back? And there's dozens of parameters just to define that. Um, so, and there's some language issues uh, that are not universal. In fact, they aren't even uniform across the US. In general, we are talking about inverters blocking and coming back during voltage and frequency depressions as so-called momentary cessation. All right, so they stop, but they pop back as soon as the, the current comes back, as opposed to tripping or latching, where when they go out, they don't come back. At least they don't come back in the time frame of a transient stability. Those things are important, and there's some question as to whether or not uh, that's done deliberately. Is that done as a response to a grid code? Is that done as a response to a cheap inverter? Okay, there's lots of, lots of emotional space to be explored there. And it makes a big difference. The other thing is, uh, just as a cautionary note, we've got, uh, 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 there's frequency in this block, and you have under frequency load shedding and all this good stuff, and people start to model inverters and say, well, you know, if the frequency goes outside of such and such a window, the inverter trips. And this is just a cautionary note. You should never, ever have instantaneous frequency trips in a phaser simulation, in a positive sequence simulation, because you cannot meaningfully measure frequency in less than a cycle. So if you have an instantaneous trip, you're going to get a garbage answer. So don't do it. Nick said so. All right. 
So I'm going to show an example here. This is work that was, uh, so we got the U.S. interconnect, the U.S. Remember the U.S. is in uh, three separate interconnections. So it's the West, the East. Texas thinks it's a separate country and it runs like one. So we're going to talk about the West here. And this is a study that was funded, um, we did in cooperation with Enron, with David's uh, company, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, it's a, I'm going to show you a little tiny piece of a big chunk of work. But we populated the system uh, with lots of distributed uh, photovoltaics spread around. So we're talking hundreds of nodes out of thousands of locations. So I just want to give you a sense of the scale, right? This is where model in the Western interconnection. There are thousands and thousands of nodes, thousands of synchronous generators, and we've got a uh, complex load. So we've populated that tremendously complicated model, right, which has got over 100 input parameters per node to 4,000 buses covering 93 gigawatts of system load, all right? This is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and those are represented, that just to get a sense of this particular thing, this is a high renewables condition, uh, again, just for your calibration, and the baby blue is the, is the rooftop, is the embedded PV, and that's the utility scale PV. A lot more big utility scale PV in North America than you're seeing in Europe, okay? We've got massive plants. There's today, today, there's just shy of 10 gigawatts of utility scale PV operating just in California, all right? And another six gigawatts of rooftop. So, and the green is wind. So it's a big, big constituent, we can't ignore it. This is the first of a couple of cautionary uh, uh, examples that I'll put in. So this is a, a nasty fault in the middle of the load center of California where there's also a fair amount of embedded rooftop and not a lot of other generation because the renewables, the wind, the solar is pushing out the fossil based generation in California. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. All right? The gr blue case is a fault and trip uh, at, a, at a key node in the middle of California, and the system recovers beautifully using the standard load model, all right? Using the standard load model. But when you start to include air conditioners and other kinds of things and uh, irrigation pumps, right? You've got some irrigation pumps in India, I think? Huh? All right? This system that goes black, all right? It's a fail, so yikes, all right? Big difference. And in fact, we repeatedly see a bigger difference between uh, the load modeling impacts than adding the solar. Okay, it's on that scale. Here's another example that the fault impedance makes a huge difference. Okay, so if we simulate a single phase fault with that complicated load model, we get a beautiful recovery as opposed to a deep fault that really causes the machines to stall. So what's going on here is induction motors are stalling and uh, I cut some of my examples short because I knew I was going to be short for time, but one of the things that will happen is that these collapses or the risk of collapse will get worse if at the same time that the motors are at risk of stalling from the voltage depression, if the local generation, that is if the watts getting injected by the local photovoltaics go away, then you get double jeopardy. The motors are pulling on the grid and they're trying to make up for the lost photovoltaics and you can get a worse stability outcome. So you've got to be really careful of whether or not your embedded PV rides through system events. And you can't do it on an individual basis. This is really for context. Uh, we have an issue in the U.S. with the IEEE standards about whether or not the photovoltaics and the other embedded generation rides through disturbances and not. That's a whole separate panel session, so I'm going to skip over it. But this is just sort of showing some simulations in which, in one case, the, uh, the generation comes right back, and in another case, it doesn't. So these are megawatts, so I'm losing... Uh, I'm losing 800 megawatts because of a grid fault across a couple hundred load nodes that were close enough to the fault to see the disturbance. Huh? 
And it has an interesting outcome that you have to be cautious about. And this is some of the kinds of things we're looking at. So we lost 800 megawatts. 800 megawatts is not a big deal for the Western system. But the local stress of losing that 800 megawatts caused a deficit of 3.1 gigavars of reactive. Right? We torqued the system. And if you don't have enough dynamic reactive, system's toast. All right? So you got to get some of these pieces right. Here's another one, and I won't, again, I'm not, the intent here is not to drag you through all the details, but big swings in the system when you put a violent fault on, which is a big thing in, in uh, western U.S., will affect the dynamics. And this is a case where I've got a recovery and a fail, and I'll just cut to the chase, in which this case the system tolerates the system disturbance which is a frequency disturbance, right? So it's a frequency event, cause a power swing, which causes a voltage depression, which causes the embedded photovoltaics to trip, in this case, and it takes the grid down. Bad outcome. Okay, so quick summary, and I'll uh, be on time here. This is a big deal, and it's a work in progress. It has been a work in progress for my entire career. It is damnably difficult one to solve, but is one which we can no longer ignore. These things that I'm showing up here are a step in the right direction. They have a nice fit with some of the other work. If anybody was in the session that I chaired earlier uh, with the open source, where there's work on these massive, uh, very uh, open databases about uh, um, where and how much load and rooftop and other stuff are in the distribution system that provides possibly a route forward for the industry to populate these complicated models. Right? The data lift is very heavy lifting, but we can't, we can't ignore it. So with that, I will stop. Thanks. Any question from the audience? To Mr. Nick Miller. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Hazem. I am from IIT Bombay. Um, I want to ask that uh, we sh you said that we should implement LVRT for all uh, PV distributed and uh, which are connected to the distributed system, right? Well, I'm not necessarily saying you should do that, but that's what's happening. But actually, uh, uh, if we want to implement uh, that, uh, that will be, will, uh, be very different mission for the DSOs to like to check all the uh, inverters which are connected to the distributed system, they have to check whether they are complying with the LVRT or not? Yeah, uh, you know, welcome to the new world. Uh, so so th this is a vigorous debate right now in many parts of the world, including the US. So frankly, maybe not quite as acute as the German 50.2 Hertz self-inflicted wound, but uh, the first generation of IEEE 1547 basically was written by distribution people that were worried about un unintended islands, inadvertent islanding. So the, the, the old rule basically says embedded photovoltaic shall not have low voltage ride through. Not, not right? And we predicted, I personally predicted this bad outcome when they were writing that standard 15 years ago, and guess what, here we are. So that standard is being rewritten to encourage low voltage ride through, and there's a balancing act between avoiding human safety and other kinds of safety issues that go with unintended islands, but maintaining the continuity of supply. So, you know, is it up to the DSO to police? Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but it is, uh, it, it's certainly a topic for grid code, in, in my opinion. Any other question? Okay, thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you.